Afrique Media. Greetings to you ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this edition of the program uh, the Pan-African debate brought to you by the Pan-African television Africa Media. Today we are here to dive into a topic of uh, great significance of course. So we are looking at the statement uh, brought forth by the World Bank Group regarding the anti-gay law promulgated by the leadership of uh, Uganda and of course uh, the topic centers on this uh, statement by the World Bank and of course the recent uh, decision uh, by the World Bank to hold new funding uh, for Uganda in response to its controversial anti-gay law. The World Bank group made the controversial statement Tuesday, a statement which the government in Kampala has slammed and termed by us. Uganda has, however, remained firm and defense, denying to overturn its decision on the gay law. Nonetheless, President Yoweri Musavani has stated that his country would leverage the internal sectors of the economy, including farming and manufacturing, to keep things running. As per some authorities, this uh, statement uh, from the World Bank represents an aspect of Western imperialism and must be denounced in all its forms. As it stands, the World Bank has an existing portfolio of $5.2 billion, I beg your pardon, which is about 4.7 billion euro in Uganda. Thus, today's program in today's program, we're going to engage in a thoughtful and engaging uh, discussion to shed light on the various perspectives surrounding the World Bank uh, decision and the implications on the economy of Uganda and why not international relations in a time that the world is experiencing a major shift in every dimension. You are most welcome. This is the Pan-African Debate. Afrique Media. You are welcome once more, ladies and gentlemen. If you are just tuning in, uh, you are most welcome to the Pan-African uh, Debate, a compelling program where we seek to discuss issues affecting the global world. And our focus today is on Uganda, and we're looking at the relationship between the East African nation and, of course, uh, the uh, uh, financial institution, the World Bank. Uh, after the, the, uh, the World Bank Group uh, made a statement uh, uh, reconsidering new funding for lending opportunities for the East African states of uh, Uganda after a gay law that was promulgated uh, uh, later this year, uh, earlier this year, uh, by uh, the uh, leadership of Uganda. We want to look at the uh, implications of this statement by the World Bank and, of course, look at how this is going to affect especially uh, the uh, uh, economy of Uganda, looking at the budget uh, that the com country has actually uh, put in place, especially for the 2023-2024 uh, economic year. And of course, this aspect, we want to also look at this aspect of sovereignty with a statement like this infringing on the internal affairs of uh, a sovereign state who want to look at the implications and that's what we are going to be answering now in the course of the de debate program which runs for two as of course go is going to be a, 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 a fruitful discussions with a panel of experts that will give analytical uh, views on uh, this topic for discussion this day to what extent uh, the World Bank is infringing in the internal affairs of a country like uh, Uganda and of course to see how the country is actually uh, reacting or the viewpoint of authorities in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa. You are most uh, welcome. Let's go straight away to uncover the panel. And I'll be taking you first of all to South Africa. Let's meet Mr. Paseka Farumale, who is the member 
for the uh, Conventioner for Pan-Africanism and Progress is joining us today to give us an insight uh, on this topic for discussion, which is actually of great significance in the present day society. Hello to you, Mr. Faramale, and thanks for honoring this invitation today. Uh, good day, good day, Clarice. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to having an engagement with you and my fellow panelist, uh, Mr. Ekani. It's always a pleasure having you, uh, Mr. Faseka Farumeli. Let's now go to Germany. We're meeting Mr. Ekane Presley, who is joining in his capacity as an international relations expert. It's a pleasure having you this day, sir. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, part of you on your panel today to discuss issues uh, relating to Africa and the world at large. And uh, it is a unique pleasure to have uh, Mr. Paseka as my co-panelist. Uh, I think it would be the second time to, to, to share a panel with him. And I, I hope memories of, uh, of a, a wonderful debate we, we, we had on the same uh, platform. Okay, thank you so much for giving this round of uh, optimal consideration, Mr. Ekane. Just to remind us of that uh, uh, this is informative as well as uh, interactive program. You can follow us live on Facebook at Africa Media TV. Leave your comments on what you think about the decision uh, by the World Bank to reconsider uh, new funding or lending opportunities for the uh, East African state, that is Uganda. Before we dive into the analysis, let's listen to this report, uh, of course, coming from the reactions of uh, Uganda regarding the statement uh, made public on Tuesday mm -hmm. by the World Bank Group. I will join you right after that. Our budget. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni denounced on Thursday the World Bank's decision to suspend new funding in response to a harsh anti-LGBTQ law. The World Bank said the law, which imposes the death penalty for certain same-sex acts, contradicted its values and that it would pause new funding until it could test measures to prevent discrimination in projects it finances. The anti-LGBTQ law, enacted in May, has drawn widespread denunciation from local and international rights organizations and Western governments though it is popular domestically. Museveni said in a statement Uganda was trying to reduce its borrowing in any case and would not give in to pressure from foreign institutions. It is therefore unfortunate that the World Bank and other actors dare to want to coerce us into abandoning our faith, culture, principles and sovereignty using money. They really underestimate all Africans, he said. The World Bank has an existing portfolio of $5.2 billion in Uganda, although these projects will not be affected. Museveni also said that if Uganda needed to borrow, it could do so from other sources and that oil production expected to start by 2025 would provide additional revenues. He added that he hoped the World Bank would reconsider its decision. Report uh, brings to light the reaction uh, of the uh, leadership of Uganda regarding the statement brought uh, forth by the World Bank Group. It should be noted that for some time now, the uh, World Bank or the position of the World Bank and also the International Monetary Fund have been very questionable and debatable uh, in Africa as to how these uh, uh, financial institutions operate. And today, we are going to be particular on this aspect of the World Bank commenting on uh, the anti-gay law promulgated by the uh, parliament in Uganda and we see the uh, financial institution going to an extent of uh, saying they will not uh, uh, proceed with new fundings uh, to Uganda if they do not overturn uh, the decision. Uh, and the question we are asking is to what extent uh, does the World Bank have the, the, the prerogative uh, to uh, engage or interfere 
on uh, the local legislature or the decisions taken by uh, a sovereign state and how feasible uh, the, st the, the bank or the statement is, also looking at the implications, of course, of the statement on the government of Uganda and to uh, an extent we want to look at the other ways that uh, uh, the areas that Uganda and also our countries across Africa can uh, leverage on to boost their economic transformation, their development agendas, without actually going to uh, the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Forum. And thank you so much. If you are just tuning in, you're welcome. It is the Pan-African debate. We're going to dive straight away with you, uh, Mr. Pasika Faromali, uh, before actually analyzing the, uh, to what extent uh, the bank's statement uh, will affect uh, Uganda, let's understand uh, the, the, the aspects of uh, the, 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 the gay law in Uganda and also in other African countries uh, before looking at the intervention from uh, this uh, international financial body. Uh, just to clarify, the, the gay law in itself is not just an African prerogative or something that we are seeing in African countries. We've been seeing a number of uh, countries, whether it's towards the east, which would be Germany and or not Germany, which would be Russia and China, uh, introducing some kind of gay laws. Uh, we've been seeing an approach from parts of, uh, of America, specifically the United States of America, where they have uh, been trying to implement some kind of laws that would be uh, controlling um, that will be controlling uh, relations between people. So uh, from my point of departure, uh, primarily, I, I, I find it highly problematic to try and control how people can interact with each other, who you decide to date, who you decide to love. It generally makes no sense to me why it's a, it's a problem or something that has to be dealt with by the government. But the way that the, gov the, the, the World Bank has reacted to Uganda's implementation of its law as a sovereign state is quite confusing and quite uh, quite stressful because what it does is that it says uh, the World Bank is now playing a responsibility where it is able to influence matters of policy and laws within a sovereign uh, state. And on its own, that is very problematic because it will mean that the country itself does not have independence in being able to develop laws that it believes should be able to influence its own population, meaning that the country now needs to be guided by laws that can only be approved or that are approved and are, 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 are guaranteed to be uh, uh, um, uh, excellent on the basis of what the World Bank and in the independent institute outside of the country uh, believes. And that in its own is very problematic because now it brings into question the ideas of sovereignty and how these uh, countries or specifically how the World Bank decides to interact with other countries that have some kind of law because these laws at the end of the day, as I said, they are all based on controlling who loves who, who decides to do. But with that that being said, we need to be cognizant of the fact that it is not in itself the World Bank interacting the same way with other countries that implement this outside of the continent of Africa, that implement these uh, uh, these laws, these um, uh, anti-LGBTQI uh, laws outside of the continent of Africa. And that is quite, quite worrying because what it means is that now we're finding ourselves in a position whereby an independent uh, body can come out and try to control matters of countries that it sees as financially, economically uh, inferior to others. And what it does is that it uses funding which is aimed to help the country itself develop so that it can influence matters of policy and law inside of that country. So with uh, 
with with that being said, I do uh, need to emphasize that it is quite problematic when you read the law in itself in detail. But when you look at it from a social political point of view, uh, from an economical point of view, it is quite stressful that a sovereign country cannot implement its own laws because of external influences that uh, threaten to make sure that threaten to cut off a, a, a economic uh, support to those countries. But in terms of the law in itself, I do believe that the law in itself does tend towards, uh, 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 um, uh, does line with what I see as somewhat problematic on a point or uh, personal point of view, because I do not believe that government should decide on who can be with who, but from an uh, analytical point of view, it is often problematic when you see that Black people of the continent of Africa have been humiliated and they've been mistreated for over the years, for several years and decades, but there has not been that international uh, international uh, pressure to make sure that uh, laws that continue to uh, subjugate Black people of the African continent uh, are overridden, you know, they are overturned. So that for me is quite problematic that why is it that a specific group of people, which in this context, specifically the LGBTQI community, why is it getting so many privileges ahead of the pro of, 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 of a bigger population of people, which is black people in the continent and outside the continent? Why is it getting so much emphasis? Why is it getting so much the attention uh, at the expense of others, other specific groups? And obviously the, the argument uh, that we can make is that in itself, the group is facing a lot of subject uh, subjectification. It's facing a lot of uh, uh, oppression from, uh, 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 from, from different populations throughout the world. But there are people who have been struggling and for some reason their uh, attention has not been placed on them as much as this uh, um, attention that we see is placed on specifically a subset or a subgroup of people. So I, I hope that I make sense, Clarice. Thank you for uh, the uh, introductory statement on uh, this uh, topic, uh, which is controversial at the same time. But then uh, we have to bring in a constructive uh, uh, discussions uh, that will bring solution to uh, the problems faced by Africa. We know that countries will always uh, function under defined moral principles. And of course, uh, they have the right to bring laws that they think can define a straight uh, society and of course uh, uh, bringing and upholding the uh, African values. Uh, in the same perspective for uh, Mr. Ekane, uh, I, I would like to have your own view uh, pertaining the anti-gay law uh, uh, enacted uh, by the parliament in uh, Uganda and uh, what are your perspective per se? Oh, thank you, Clarice, uh, for once more for having me on your program today. Um, with regards to your question, I I want to say that um, we are uh, in the face of uh, in the face of what uh, Africa ha has been dealing with for for quite a long time, which is having to be confronted to paternalistic uh, paternalistic. Um, of forces, especially from the West, yeah. but um, as much as we want to uh, decry this um, uh, Western implications into African politics, uh, we are also compelled uh, to have um, a code view and a code analysis uh, with re regards to certain topics, and uh, the, the one at hand is the the, the anti-gay um, um, the anti-gay law in Uganda and the, and the ensuing uh, uh, suspension of funds from the World Bank. Um, but the question, the fundamental question here is why Uganda? Why Uganda when uh, countries like Cameroon have uh, anti-gay laws? When countries like Nigeria, where countries like uh, Sudan and many other countries in Africa have anti-gay laws? Why Uganda? And then we are brought to the um, the reality that we need to um, uh, 
delve into somewhat into what I would call the interpretation of the law, because as I said, other countries have anti-gay laws, but here we're talking about a country uh, that is not only uh, uh, criminalizing LGBTQ, mm -hmm. but uh, submitting them to death sentences, and it, it brings us back to um, to the whole question of our the fundamental fundamental rights of human beings, which um, on the top of the list stands the right to life, the right to life, and uh, further uh, with the, uh, further we have the right to food and the right to sexual orientation and all of that. Um, uh, we I personally cannot understand why um, uh, the, decrimin the the criminali criminalization of LGBTQ uh, has to has to uh, be extended to death sentences. Maybe it's um, it's a means of dissuasion, but, of, but but no matter how, no matter the content we put in it, it is enacted into law in, the, in Uganda, and it is worrisome uh, because we are in a society that is evolving. We we are in a society with uh, changing practices, um, and. Um, uh, it is um, worrisome to 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 discover that uh, Uganda would uh, extend its uh, extend its um, or put put uh, um, a death threat to laws enacted by its legislature, but then it brings us to the question of sovereignty, or where the limits of our sovereignty and because the notions, uh, terms have been used uh, in, in in ways that um, in ways that um, uh, give certain countries um, some liberties. Sometimes I find them extreme under the guise of sovereignty. Uh, we cannot just do everything because we feel we are sovereign nations. Um, in this case, uh, Uganda, but then. On the other side, with the sanction of the World Bank, the whole idea, the paternal, the, the, like I said, the, the paternalism still finds its way under, on, 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 in decision making with the, the coercive nature of the West, and you have to ask yourself questions uh, as to um, the way Africa must react in terms in 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 engaging the world with a certain kind of legitimacy and in, in, in ways as to have its sovereignty. Um, uh, we, can, we cannot just um, all the time delve into, delve into emotions as to why, why, um, why Africa, because like I said, this are, there are lots of countries in Africa that are anti-gay, but this, yeah. this is, is quite worrisome to, to know that human beings would be subject to a death sentence because of of uh, of the choices they make about their sexual orientation and uh, i think it also compels us to 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 deeper thought as to as to um as to as to claiming sovereignty because you cannot you cannot aspire to sovereignty when you don't build a certain kind of uh, financial financial independence when you don't build a certain kind of economic independence when you don't build a certain kind of poli uh, uh, social political independence you should expect these bodies these bodies uh, uh, that claim that claim to lean on some fundamental human rights you should you should expect that it would come at you when you take certain decisions and I, like I said we, we 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 would be very faulty to just to just delve into emotions and say that the World Bank is curtain uh, is curtain uh, funds from Uganda without um, having to put an eye on the interpretation of the anti-gay law in Uganda? I think that's the crux of the matter, because other countries uh, in the West and in Africa are adopting anti-gay laws, even in the United States, but they haven't had their funds uh, cut. And now uh, I think it's a means of cohesion on on, on Uganda is is putting pressure on them. But as, a, you, as the humanity that we are, we should also question ourselves if people should be subject to death because of 
uh, uh, because of choosing to be who they are. Whether we accept, whether we accept, uh, whether we think it's a, it's, it's a practice uh, um, uh, in the antipodes of 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 our of our humanity, it's another question. But to to it's a big. Uh, uh, it's a big question as to know if if that it, in itself is it's uh, right to subject people to the death sentence because of the choices they make. So, Mr. Ekane, and that's where the problematic lies. And uh, we uh, continue to analyze to bring, of course, uh, uh, understanding uh, in uh, this uh, uh, very problematic topic, uh, the anti-gay law, and of course, uh, like the report that we listened to, uh, People, of course, some authorities in Uganda have already uh, challenged uh, the, uh, uh, the decision and of uh, seeing how uh, the, the, the sanctions, of course, uh, can be uh, made to be less coercive. Now, the, the, uh, one of contention here lies on the involvement of uh, the, uh, the World Bank. Uh, and like you said, a lot is happening across the global world. Perspectives are changing. We see in the sphere of influence and we see uh, countries uh, uh, coming actually to capitalize on Africa. So they are actually capitalizing on uh, areas where they can frustrate African nations. This is according to the viewpoint of some people where they can frustrate uh, the leadership and of course see them come back in again. You know, there's the drive to see that Africa has a financial autonomy that will help the continent also have some uh, uh, autonomy as far as economy and other political decisions are concerned. So now, uh, let me continue again uh, with you, Mr. Ekane. Uh, 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 the first question is, we are looking at uh, the like what implications of the World Bank's decision uh, to hold uh, or halt funding for Uganda's anti-gay law. What are the implications, and uh, how does this impact the country's economy, development projects, and of course overall relationship with international partners, which is very imperative. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, 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 the cutting of funds at 5.2 billion is a huge amount, and it would take it would certainly take a toll on the economy. Um, I find a little bit. Uh, I think the excuse of, of President uh, Yuri Museveni is quite bold uh, in in saying that we would we would uh, turn to new partners. We would turn to new partners to seek funding, but. It brings it brings to light uh, what I what I decry in the, in, in, in the last years. Africa's uh, most of Africa's uh, African nations denial of accountability. You know, denial of accountability. It's not it's not because there are times we have to be um, um, honest with our analysis. It's not we are not we're not talking about a country. That has been cut funds because they are criminalizing homosexuality. We're talking about a country that has been uh, put in the limelight because of the interpretation of the LGBTQ law. And if if the response to that is to seek new partners, new partners, which I guess would be Russia or China, it is worrisome because it's what is a pattern we're witnessing in Africa today. We find Mali kicking out uh, of France, Burkina Faso kicking out France, and all these countries kicking out France because they are seeking for new partners that are not asking for any accountability in the affairs of government. And that is so worrisome because it's, it's not enough to say we're kicking out US, we're kicking out France, we're kicking out the EU because we have rogue systems like China and, 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 and Russia that would or roll out the carpet for us without asking for any sort of accountability. And um, it is so, uh, it's problematic, not just to African governments, but to the African people who are seeking new partnerships, who are seeking new partnerships, as long as these new partners do not question government, do not question the way business is run in this country, do, do, do not question uh, violations of human rights, do, do not question valid violations of the constitution and i think it is it's it's not just enough to say that we 
we have we are victims of a certain kind of post uh, uh, post colonialism or neo colonialism. Uh, seeking new partners is not the way out. For me, I think uh, Africans today are, have engaged in what I call the shortcut, the shortcut, and this the 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 the, the sanction on Uganda. It's, a, it's another clear aspect because, of course, they will be hit economically. They will be hit economically, and the decision are, are meted out by the World Bank. It's, a, it's, it's, it's one of cohesion, and they're pushing the Uganda to the wall in order to... But I think the question here is not the World Bank asking Uganda to institutionalize uh, 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 same-sex same um, uh, same relations. It's in the interpretation of the law which is which is uh um which reads out of um um our, our sentencing lgbtq plus people to death sentences that is the question but instead of probably um uh inviting the legislation the legislator in uganda to 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 maybe see deep into the matter they are escaping and they're 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 they're, they're, they're quick to interpret that it's another is another Western uh, oppression on Africans. I, I, I would say I beg to deny because all the time, all the time when these things occur, it is so quick to say, "Oh, uh, uh, with a paternalism." Even if it were the AU, even if we, we were seeking funds from the AU, the, the our sovereignty, sovereignty of African states should be respected. I agree with that. But if sovereignty infringes. If it infringes our rights to exist as humans, then there is a question. And again, I, I want to go back to this to this LGBTQ. The world is evolving, rightly so, and it's 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 fair enough to say that from um, the world is not the same as it was sixty years ago. But it brings us back to the question of African fostering its own values. I like to say, for example, if you are, it's not enough to say we're. If it's not enough to say um, uh, I am against LGBTQ. Africa should Africa in the 21st century should be able to define itself. We should be able to um, to use our institutions to promote our own values because the same West, the same West that considers uh, LGBTQ as as a social evolution, should be able to consider should not should not criminalize uh, uh, polygamy as um, I should not criminalize or view polygamy as a barbaric method of 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 of, of relations, and and it's not up to them to decide whether polygamy, for example, polygamy, for example, it's a form of 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 union in Africa. It's us to advance this. It's us to tell them this is our way, and for us to be able to tell them this is our way, we we need to seek ways for financial independence for political independence, for economic independence, for social independence, because you cannot promote values which are, which are proper to you when you don't have an economic power. So the World Bank is doing this. They are coercing today because they have the money. They have the money, so they, they could intimidate you as they want. So it's not enough for Africa to say, oh, that's, that's not our faith, that's not our culture. It's time for Africa to be able to say, to sit on the world stage and say polygamy is part of us. It's part of us, and to say that, and before saying that, you have to strengthen institutions as the, like the African Union, like the Afri uh, African Development Bank, so that when the World Bank, when the World Bank plays tricks at you, you know how to fall to the African Development Bank because it's sad enough that you, the Uganda today says we will seek for new funding methods, but those funding methods are not coming from the African, would not come from the African Union, it would not come from the uh, our African Development Bank. They will be turning towards China and towards Russia, who would unroll the carpet for them. Okay, you can you can do whatever with your people. You can submit them to death sentence as long as as long as you we we are you you're giving us what we want. And and it is sad. It is counter progress for the African people. So that's what I I, I thought I could add to that.
for Mr. Ekane Fazard. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Paseka Faramaler, uh, I want us to, to analyze a, a statement that uh, Mr. Ekane uh, underlined in his analysis. He made mention uh, uh, of uh, the, the latest happening in Mali, the Central African Republic, and of course, uh, he actually underlined the fact that uh, these countries are sending away France. And uh, earlier on, while he was talking, he, he made mention about the aspects of interpretation. And uh, you will bear with me, Mr. Ekane and Mr. Paseka Farumali, that if Africa is unable to attain a level of uh, financial independence or economic prowess, it's because the continent is still tied to some of the, the parts that uh, the countries entered with the uh, former colonial masters. And I, I, like we said, and we've been saying in our debate programs, it is the wind of change that is blowing across Africa, where we want to, to see that Africa regains independence in very crucial area. Like you mentioned, Mr. Ikane, the, the aspect of, uh, of funding, the aspect of uh, uh, economic decisions, and even some political decisions. When we talk about, you're talking about uh, this country is sending away France. Is it uh, that they are actually uh, counteracting uh, the, the laws, of the, the governing laws uh, that or the binding laws uh, that guide their countries and uh, their existing partners? Or is it that they are sending away? We understand, it, like you said, it's the area of multilateralism and a wind of change, and people are reconsidering uh, or wanting to, to renegotiate their terms of, uh, of business with countries. So, Mr. Paseka, I, I, I would love to know your own perspective regarding this, uh, especially uh, as far as countries are concerned, because it seems to be another uh, war of words between uh, who wants to trade with who and if this country says I do not want I am not very happy with uh, the existing laws or binding laws between France and Mali and I and I think Russia is favorable you know it's it's so con uh, I, I don't know controversial uh, this time around because it is the time that Russia and other BRIC, uh, BRICS nations are actually engaging more with countries across uh, the continent. What's your own uh, perspective on what Mr. Ekane said, Mr. Paseka Farumele? Thank you, thank you, Clarice. I think that's a very brilliant point because um, what he speaks to is this idea that people who control your who control your, your 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 flow of cash in a country are the people who control the policies that will be in place because if once they say we stop uh, supplying you with this cash flow what happens is that you become desperate and in you being desperate now you start finding yourself in a very complex uh, position whereby you do not have a cash flow that means that your currency and economy become stagnant and eventually you're developed as a developed your development as a developing country starts to stagnate so it's simple as that that means that these people are able to control the core of your country growing and developing to a better and bigger country by just doing something as simplistic as saying that no we will not be funding you we will not continue funding you will not control uh, continue sending you uh, money because we do not agree with these policies so now it goes back to the idea of sovereignty because if countries are not able to apply laws that they find uh, as laws that can liberate or take their country forward, then it means that there is an extra uh, superpower which is responsible for the country's law. So with that being said, we would need to find ourselves in a totally, uh, uh, for us to find total sovereignty as a continent and as countries within a continent, we would need to be able to be controlling our own economies. And at this point, we are not at that point yet. 
primarily because we are so dependent in what is happening at the at the externally uh, outside of the continent. We are so dependent on our former colonizers who continue to uh, to make the argument that they will uh, fund, they will help in one, two, and three. But with that funding comes great responsibility, and it also comes um, the ability to control matters that are happening within the country. So how do we get rid of that? The first primary thing that we need to start thinking about is to make sure that we have total uh, economic liberation as a continent. Once you have that, then you are able to uh, offer a different engagement with the rest of the world, where you are able to make an argument for your standpoint, where you are able to push uh, policies uh, that are uh, uh, that are for the betterment of your own country and your own population. So that is very important, that economic liberation. But how do you do it at this point in time? Because we have this over-dependency on external powers. That's why President Museveni was, uh, said that he will go outside and look for alternative uh, uh, alternative supporters, basically people to collaborate with. But I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have. This over-dependence on external people to who, 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 who have their own uh, uh, who have their own plans when they come and they help you. So once we cannot, once we can work on having less dependence on external powers, then and only then should we be able to apply policies and laws that we believe are correct and right uh, 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 for ourselves and our people but we can always go back and argue one of the most important thing and i think that mr akane uh touched on it something that is very imp uh, important this law in itself is very problematic the core of the law in itself is very problematic when we analyze the law in itself it is easy for us to make an argument to be against the application of a law which aims to govern um, human rights or human participation or human, human existence in Uganda specifically and particularly uh, in this context. So if we look at the law in itself, it's very problematic because I believe that it is very regressive in its nature. It's a law that is taking us 10 steps back. I've been thinking about the history of why Uganda is at a place that it is with its LBGTQI uh, official and unofficial laws or the way that they interact with this community. Um, if you think about it, then if you, if, 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 if you investigate what is happening there, what you will learn is that there has been a lot of radical right wing uh, American politics, conservative American politics that influenced the laws that we are currently seeing in place in Uganda. The radical right, what it did was it went to Uganda and it was teaching the people of the country on how people are supposed to exist. These are people who are very conservative in nature. And what that did is that it led us to having an animal that could not be controlled by anyone else. And that is why we find Uganda where it is today. If you see the law today, you can see that it collaborates a lot with what Governor Dos Santos, um, the, the guy who wants to run for presidency and oppose Donald Trump, uh, what he's trying to do himself in his state, what he's been trying to implement in his state. You can see these two things speak to each other, but the response is totally different why because of our over dependence on external powers they can make the same argument um the santos and president museveni can make the same argument but you know what is uh, going to happen the way that it's going to be received by the rest of the world and the impact that is going to to, to 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 the impact that is going to be felt on the ground will be significantly different because there is an over dependency by us as a people of the continent while america still maintains some level of sovereignty and they are able to fight back militarily financially economically and etc so you see those 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 those, those two things it, it 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 makes us now to be aware that the law in itself as problematic as it is and the history of where the law uh, finds itself eventually is at are, 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 are things that are, are quite problematic in their nature 
and there are things that are easy to argue against. But the problem is how we can see the World Bank being able to flex its muscles and influence actual policy and which tells us a lot about us as a continent that there's so many laws that we see right now where Mali, Burkina Faso and the likes are saying no we are tired of these external influences they deny them they say that Africa is at the state that it is because of its own leadership but what we start seeing more and more especially when our fellow brothers in uh, in the Sahel take over their countries what we start seeing is that there's an over over uh, overarching relationship that they still have, that we still have with our former colonizers. Those relationships are still here. And that means that those countries are still able to heavily influence what happens on the ground. So that means that the, 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 the space that we find the continent in is not 100% dependent on us alone, but it's dependent and heavily dependent on external powers that continue to play a significant role in how we decide to guide ourselves or how we should be guiding ourselves. So technically, we are not even guiding ourselves. We are not even living by laws that, uh, that, that, that are for us, but we are living by these laws that have been set by them. And that is why they are able to easily uh, manipulate and influence our reality on the ground, yet still come out and make the argument that um, Africa is a failing continent because of their politicians. Our politicians are very problematic, but what we come to learn and what we come to see is that they are not independent. They are not uh, thinking from a point of sovereignty, but they are departing from a point of being overly dependent on others. So whatever law that they put into place, it's a law that has to make sure that it aligns with what the rest of the general West in this context is or is acceptable to them. Also, I reiterate that the law in itself, the, the LGBT, anti-LGBTQI uh, law in, 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 in Uganda is very problematic in itself, but what it has done, it has shown us something that the, that the West has been denying and rejecting, that we are not totally as independent as we'd like to think we are. I thank you, Clary. Let me stay with you, Mr. Paseka. Uh, you, you've ended by saying uh, that when all of this happened, it shows uh, that Africa is only independent on papers. Now the question is, you know, there are other countries like let, we are going to the, the Middle East and, and of course some countries in Africa and even in America uh, that actually do not, uh, uh, um, uh, actually criminalizes those acts. You know, so the, the question is, why uh, so hard? Because here we're not talking about who should be, uh, who should be what or whatsoever. We want to understand the relationship uh, that the World Bank has in the internal affairs of a sovereign country. Because if we are talking today, we want to see how uh, Africa can engage with the, the, the global world on equal terms you know, equal terms in the sense that African politicians and other stakeholders should be able to, to be intentional about how they negotiate with external partners or international partners. You bear with me that and uh, you and Mr. Ekane just hi highlighted uh, that uh, it is a, a moment of a narrative shift, uh, both in Africa and uh, the world at large. But then can we uh, work in uh, uh, silos? No, we can. We must work with others. So, how can we now engage with the others? So, the question I'm giving you again, uh, Mr. Paseka Faromele, is: What is the place of the World Bank? And of course, in uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 suspending, uh, because actually you said the, the law is very uh, critical. And of course, when you look at the decision of the World Bank, other pundits will also say that it's really critical by, by saying that uh, it is going to hold new funding. Whereas we know that countries for now, that's uh, the institution and others that countries have been actually uh, uh, soliciting funds for, for development agendas. So how is this, uh, a decision by the World Bank uh, going to affect Uganda 
and of course, and how is it further straining the existing relationship between Uganda and of course countries that are actually shareholders in the World Bank Group? Thank you, Clarice. You know, um, it, 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 it's quite uh, mind blowing when you look at what has been happening in the world right now. I look at uh, from a sporting point of view, from a sporting point of departure, I look at what Saudi Arabia has been doing recently and uh, the reaction from the rest of the world. Um, in the Middle East, a lot of countries have these stern laws against homosexuality. They say that you will be arrested for being in a relationship with someone. You'll be, but these are countries that were evil. Just last year, if I'm not mistaken, there was a World Cup, a football World Cup that happened in a country which illegalized um, homosexual relationships. But that country, it continued to have a successful tournament. And right now, it's getting to a point where it's receiving more and more attention because it's able to attract more people, be, uh, more football players because of its financial stability, economic and financial stability. What that tells you is our problems are primarily because of where we find ourselves from a socioeconomic point of departure as a continent. So our laws, the laws that we can put in place become heavily dependent on, on how uh, we align them with people with with organizations such as the world bank so you cannot be totally independent of the world bank you are heavily dependent and relying on external funders for you to have a functional country while in the middle east a number of these countries are able have become self-sustained so what that means is that they are able to sustain themselves and function without the help necessarily as you said we cannot exist in silos but without necessarily over dependence on external features so that means that they are able to have laws in place because of how economically and politically strong they have become that are not dependent on what others can say from the outside there were protests um, before the world cup there were protests we were saying this is an oppressive regime it is not enabling of uh, people to express themselves how they want to it is not enabling for people to exist for being who they want to be those protests didn't go anywhere. There was a World Cup. There were people who were, people went from all over the world to the World Cup. It was successful, that World Cup. But you know why? It's because of this new uh, ability to self-sustain and not be overly reliant on external powers, as our country currently is. And that is why we can be held hostage as a continent. We can be held hostage by external powers. And we see it even now in 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 in. in in uh, uh, what do you call in Niger, we see it even now in, in, in Mali, we see it in Burkina Faso, we see all these countries that the ex there's external people who are trying to influence how these people guide themselves. But because they have strong leadership, which is, you know, this is leadership which has proven itself to be quite resilient. And as I will always emphasize, I do not necessarily agree with coup d'etat and, and whatnot, but from what these leaders are currently saying and the points that they are making, if you can see how strong they've uh, decided to, 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 to make themselves by just centering independence away from France specifically and opening alternative routes and other people to work with. It is very difficult, it is not easy, and it will not be easy. But by being able to make sure that these people try to send that the population of the country instead of themselves as politicians and center corruption and so that they can continue to benefit and the West can come in and influence them by paying them large amounts of money so that they can steal even a lot more from them. Then we see that these people are, are leaders that the populations in these countries are quite happy about. From what we are seeing currently, these are people that are able to say we are going to present these laws, we are going to present these policies, we are going to do one, two, and three for our people. And the people seem relatively uh, confident in their leadership. Why? Because these are not people who are not who are who continue to be over reliant on the on, on external uh, influences, specifically their former colonizers. They are trying to break to 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 break their ties with them to the best of their abilities. 
if you are still overly dependent on on your external uh, uh, on on your former colonizer none of this would be even possible we wouldn't be seeing what we are currently seeing in the rest of the continent of africa thank you clarice the Paseke, uh, Paseka family, I beg your pardon. Uh, just to remind those of you tuning in, that this is the Pan African debate on the Pan African television, Afric Media. And today we are analyzing uh, the anti gay law enacted by the parliament in Uganda, looking at the implications and, of course, uh, relating it to the decision of the World Bank Group regarding lending opportunities or future lending opportunities for the East African nation. What are the implications on this uh, of these decisions on the economic path or the economic or the budget of the country for the year 2023-2024? Uh, uh, 2024? Uh, this is actually what we're talking about. If you are just joining in, you're most welcome. And we're going to continue the debate with uh, Mr. Kane Presley. Now, the question I want to direct to you, sir, is like, how does this decision, you know, by the World Bank contribute to a broader uh, discussion on, on the, uh, the, the responsibilities of international organizations in uh, addressing human rights, as, uh, of course, human rights, you know, uh, like we earlier said, a country is actually acting on its own moral principles and how it will want to define its own uh, society. But then, uh, since we said uh, the world is changing and, and the perspectives are actually changing, let's look at uh, the, the role of these international uh, organizations in addressing uh, aspects which they consider to be a violation of uh, human rights and how how can uh, these organizations actually shift uh, from uh, maybe uh, uh, linking uh, the, the, the decisions or the, 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 the internal legislation of countries and of course uh, the, the engagement on other aspects of like uh, for example uh, funding or lending uh, for development projects? Um, thank you once more Clarice. Um, um, the word, as it is, um, leans on, on a document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This, this document has been codified and enacted by many nations in the world, including Uganda. But what we find today, uh, what we find today and what we experience in the world today is the notion that I like to call double morality. Double morality um, where, um, where we have documents, sometimes I even founding documents of organizations. But then I like to say that we are in a predatory world. We're in a predatory world where um, uh, documents, norms, and laws uh, are generally um, and usually are violated by, by countries that have an edge on other countries. And then it brings back the whole idea of sovereignty and independence of nations, which is also, which are also idealistic uh, um, uh, notions, because in reality, we we have to espouse uh, the theory of realism, where um, I like to say we are we we are, we are, we, are, we are in some kind of a jungle where we experience predation of each other. Uh, having said that, um, the way uh, the the, the behavior of, of international actors on the global scene um, uh, is, is, um, is permitted by the whole idea of power. And I would say that to, to, to engage this world, to engage this world, to take decisions like the World Bank is doing today, uh, we must, uh, be in a position of power because it is said states are equal 
that is idealistic, but in reality, they're not equal. We must be in a position of power and, and, and we can only access uh, power if we have the strategy of power. It's only through strategy that we can uh, unlock multi-dimensional power. And that is what is gravely, gravely missing on, on the African continent. As my co-panelist uh, said moments ago, he gave uh, succinct examples as uh, Saudi Arabia or the Middle East, where you find uh, countries that have very stern LGBTQ uh, plus laws, but uh, countries that are unperturbed by the West or the Western institutions because they have, they have the financial uh, uh, power to roll back whatever sanctions come to them. And he, he, made a, he gave an example of the World Cup where it was a whole brawl about, about the limitations of human actions during the World Cup competition. But the, 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 this country's uh, Qatar was unperturbed and the World Cup was a success. And now we have uh, Western players flooding into Saudi Arabia and Qatar to play football irrespective of the stringent laws in those countries is to tell you that when you are when you when you have when you have the tool of your beating when you have the tool of your beating um sanctions uh from the world bank uh, cannot cannot face you out and it brings it brings us back to 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 us as a people of africa uh uh, uh, to question not only our institutions, but also our governments. Because it's my conviction that um, the era, the era of, of strong men in the African continent, the, the, the era of, of, of the Mandelas, of the, of the Nyereres, of, of the Nkrumas, uh, are gone. And we, we, have it, we find it so hard uh, for, for these men, this kind of man, a man of, man of caliber to be, re, to be reborn on the African continent. We find it so hard to, to bequeath an international, uh, in, international institution that are worthy of us as a people. Because today, uh, what we experience, and, and the question we have to ask ourselves is how, how we could, um, how we could be unfazed by Western sanctions, how we could be unfazed by Western interventions, how we could be unfazed by Western paternalism. That's the fundamental question. And the, 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 we, we cannot keep coming on, on weekends on African Afri media and crying foul to what comes to us. Because when, the, when, when, it's, when it becomes too repetitive, then it's, it becomes too, uh, and then it becomes worrisome at the same time. Um, today, uh, it's so shocking that the conflict or the coup d'etat, as, as it is happening in West Africa, does not have, uh, does not come with a resounding voice from an African institution like the AU. It's disturbing that the sanction of the World Bank does not receive a statement from a body like the African Union. And then it tells you that we get to the realization that it's just an empty box. Without a, without a shared voice, without a political statement, because we, no matter, no matter how we try to interpret the laws in Uganda, we are in the face of um, a, country, a country whose sovereignty is being attacked. And sovereignty is a political thing. We expect that the people of the, the, the leaders of the continent under the, under, the, under the umbrella of the African Union, could be able to put out a voice and say, no, this is an attack of a sovereign state. And probably call Yuri Museveni behind closed doors and tell them, hey, brother, as much as the sanctions are hard on your country, we think that you've gone too far. But it's not existing. It's the same thing happening in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in, in Niger, where we have the only, the only international uh, uh, organization that has under its umbrella all its countries is the most successful political organization which has all its countries under an institution. 
but it's sad to know that 50, 54 countries are unitedly divisive where there is no where there is no one common voice and then you ask yourself because today we're talking about uganda tomorrow we'll be on another debate talking about another african country and then it brings you back it brings you back to it to to the notion of autonomy because today we have we have to deal with the Bretton Woods institution of course the imf is a britain the world bank is a britain, it's a britain Woods institution years ago we had Gaddafi. We had Gaddafi who sold a dream, who sold a dream to the entire continent, that of that of, uh, of birthing an African development bank, which would secure us from financial independence from these bodies. What did we do? We let him go on his, we let him go on his, uh, on his, on his, on his offer, and almost saw it as a vanity offer. We let him, we, we sold him out to the West. Because it's a continent that sold him out to the West. We sold Gaddafi out to the, to the West, and today Libya has become a corridor for, for, for African immigration. Today, and today we are crying foul. We are crying foul when the World Bank is meting out sanctions on a country like as Uganda. It, 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 it's it, the, the whole question of us as a people. I, I think there's a lot of us watching this program now. We need to start questioning ourselves as the African people. What we really want. How long are we going to sit behind our TV programs and cry foul and say Africa? We, we can't keep crying for long. We can't keep crying for long. It's time to birth not only leaders, but institutions. It's time to... Um, to uh, um, birth new mentalities because the biggest problem in Africa today is not wars, it's not corruption, it's the mentality. It is the mentality. I, I always say Africa is in the mental side. It is, it is a mentality. And once we would be able to format, to all, or format the African mind, then we would understand that as much as you want to uh, sell out our notions or values as polygamy and call it an African value, you should be able to know that no one deserves to die because they choose who to love. So it's, it's double standards. And as much before condemning LGBTQ, you should be able to sell polygamy and tell them that. And to sell polygamy, you should be financially stable. You should be economically stable. You should be politically secure. And it's when you have all these ingredients that you start talking of sovereignty. You are not sovereign when you keep begging. You are not sovereign when you have sanctions and say you turn to new partners, and those partners are not Africans. There is no, it would never, it would, I would never clam or clap for any African country who would drop France, who would drop Britain to have Russia and China. No, you don't, you don't, you don't open, you don't invite a double, a second scramble for Africa. You don't invite it. The next wave. The next wave after slavery, after colonialism, after post-colonialism, should be an African unity, as propounded by Mandela, as propounded by, by these people who paved the way. So today, I am not subscribing to uh, verbal idealism. It's time to take action. It is time to behave in a way that our children our children should inherit of 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 of, of Ndosa land, of Tanzania, of these countries that are so beautiful, but that are so sacrificed by leaders, some of whom we did not choose. So we cannot keep we cannot keep making an outpour week week in week out about our about our. Um, about our suffering state, because we're not suffering. We have it all. We we have we have a lot on the African soil and on the African sub soil. We cannot we, we we cannot predict on our people, and then expect and expect to be clapped for. It, it it's time to say enough. It's time to revisit the visionaries, the dreams they have for the continent. It's time to question ourselves why fifty four nations. 
to the site when Gaddafi was being docked out from his village in Sirte and killed. It is time to question ourselves why the heroes of the past, as Thomas Sankara was murdered. It is time to ask ourselves a lot of questions, but more importantly, more importantly, it is time to speak in a shared voice, one diplomatic voice, one economic voice, because as much as we want to look at ourselves divided, uh, uh, a European in Germany, when he meets me on when he meets me on the streets, he would first call me African before calling me Cameroonian. So that's the reality. We are we are put in the same box, and we have to act accordingly. And it's only by acting uh, in a in a united front, building institutions that are able to protect us against these coercive methods that we can engage the future and bequeath a better promise for our children and our children's children. Daikane, it's about uh, developing or adopting the good or the better mindset for the uh, continent. But then uh, you said something which I want you to throw more light on again. Uh, you actually uh, underlined the fact that Africa has values, but these values cannot be internationally recognized because lack of because of lack of economic uh, economic priorities, political priorities, and of course financial power. So now the question is: Must Africa uh, be at the helm? For, 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 for its values to be heard and actually recognized internationally because when we look at what is happening and even the wars we see around the world is the quest for power. And what, what if uh, your ideologies are being uh, brought to the fore without actually undermining uh, the uh, uh, values of other countries or the sovereignty of other states? Most Africans, rely on uh, the economic its economic priorities and others to be able to make known its in its own uh, uh, values which are morally uh, upriding and uh, upright and also can uh, define a clear trajectory for the world at large yeah thank you very much um international relations international politics as it is today mm -hmm. um leans on several theories at the same time. The theory of realism, uh, um, neoliberalist neo theory, as importantly, integrationist theory. Mm -hmm. And the theory of integration is all encompassing, all encompassing, meaning you cannot, you cannot um, engage the world if you're not economically strong. You cannot engage the world if you're not if you, do, if you do not have a politically projecting voice, you cannot engage the world if you do not have a strong military. That is why countries, for example, like Qatar, Qatar is it's just a small country, but you find them buying uh, 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 fighter jets, M16, building them some militarily. I mean, a country that is landlocked, but investing in its in its uh, uh, in its defense weaponry. Why is, why is the problem in Africa? Africa is the only continent which is, which is more demographically um, potent than any other continent. We are more than one billion people. Africa is the only continent with, with, a, with a buoyant youth. Africa is the only continent with a plethora of languages. But most importantly, Africa is the is a pool of resources. Sure. And when you put all of, yeah, when you put all of that together, you cannot understand why the continent is still at the false start. That's the big problem. And then you come to the realization that you need to decolonize the African mentality because you can't have you can't have everything. You can't have everything that um, that sets you for progress. You can't have everything that sets you for power. You can't have everything that sets you on, on the biggest, on the biggest, on the global stage. Yet you are still in the antipodes of progress. You are still in you are still on the false start. 
So today, whether whether uh, what you call our values, what you call first of all, we we Africa does not exist in um we do not exist in the void. We exist in the world. We exist in the world. We exist in a global world, mm -hmm. and the oh, we cannot access this world. We cannot access the promises of this world if we do not exploit our different resources, material resources, financial resources. And that would not be possible. All of that would not be possible if we do not build a strategy. It's a strategy. It's only strategy that opens doors to multi-dimensional power. Before, before Tata could organize the World Cup, they built stadia, they, they built businesses, they exploited their, pet, their petrol, they gave loans out to, the, to Western powers. When you, once you keep being on the begging side, once you keep begging, being on the begging side, you are voiceless. This is a, this, this, this is a basic, this is a, a basic uh, human notion. When you're on the begging side, you are dependent. The only ways to be to become independent is to tap into your own resources, develop your own resources, build institutions, transform minds that will be able to talk on the global stage with a sense, with a sense of 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 of, 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 of autonomy, with a sense of independence, and that's the only way you invite people. On, on, on the legitimate um, uh, sort of cooperation, meaning if you're if you if you if you if you have to discuss resources, if you have to talk diplomacy, if you have to discuss economy, you talk with a legitimate voice. Unfortunately, that's not what that's not what we see. But like I said, the the saddest thing is that we have everything, everything, to be on top of the world yet. It's not the case, so it's it's quite paradoxical, very paradoxical to see that the continent with everything is a continent with nothing. Mm -hmm. Narratives are being changed across Africa to live from the continent of everything to the continent of everything, uh, where uh, we will see feasible uh, development across. Uh, Mr. Ekane, while talking earlier on, you said uh, some of these debates uh, sometimes do not yield, but uh, I will say that uh, debates, especially uh, uh, that have been conducted on African media television, have gone a long way uh, to change our uh, uh, mindset, to change perspective. Perspectives like I will underline uh, that uh, when we are here to d discuss on something like this, like it's not actually uh, trying to criticize the, the World Bank or any other country, Western country, uh, putting sanctions on Africa, but of course to discuss on how we can survive without these. And of course, it's already a way forward towards charting a clear part for the continent Africa. Uh, with all said, uh, Mr. Paseka Faromeli, we have analyzed uh, these, and of course, we see that most of times when the Western world and other powers uh, try to, to uh, dictate on how things are run across Africa, it's because of the lack of economic, political, and financial priorities. Now, the question is what is the role of uh, diplomacy? and uh, actually constructive dialogue as far as we're bringing us back uh, to our topic for discussion, the decision of the World Bank on Uganda, and of course uh, the uh, anti-gay law that, uh, which seems to be problematic both in Uganda and elsewhere. So let's look at the role of diplomacy and constructive dialogue in uh, uh, arriving uh, a position of compromise where uh, everybody's viewpoint will be critically in light without actually penalizing uh, others. Uh, thank you, thank you, Clarice. You know, um, as of late, one of the biggest problems that I have is that Africa in itself is struggling with its own inter-diplomacy where different African countries can be able to successfully work together towards a common goal. 
um and because of that it's difficult for us to go to the rest of the world as a united front so that we can center ourselves and say that this is who we are and this is what we want as a continent or as a people of a continent and that makes it very difficult if you look at uh, uh, matters of diplomacy in the in the continent we currently have ECOWAS which is willing to go to war for the west so that it can go to war with Niger why because they believe that um Niger should not uh, take the decision that they have taken with the coup and etc and uh, many other uh, uh, resulting policies that are coming out of the said coup you, you see so now it means that it becomes very difficult for us to say uh, what is the role of diplomacy moving forward? A difficult thing when you think about the role of ECOWAS right now in saying that we are willing to have our soldiers on standby against our own brothers and sisters who are our neighbors so that we can make sure that Niger is not able to kick out those who come from the West. What that says is that the an idea of diplomacy in order to liberate ourselves as a continent is very it's, 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 it's a very difficult one and one that I'm not going to to lie and say that I see the possibility of it being a successful uh, go to or move forward, because if you think about it, if we believe that diplomacy and interworkings within the continent would result in us being able to say we cannot have laws which are going to subjugate a specific group of people to certain levels of abuse and discrimination, then what is going to happen is that we are now going going to start making this or going back to this argument of sovereignty that okay how are you able to say as a neighbor that mm, you the a specific country cannot apply this law in itself uh, because what that means is that you are having problems with matters that do not necessarily concern you uh, I think the most important thing that that really puts me off and that makes it very difficult for us I think the most important thing is that the role of the AU in us functioning as a continent is not, uh, it has not been sufficiently explored because the AU in itself, it should be the basis of uh, African unity between and amongst ourselves as a continent. And then we can get to the discussion of diplomacy, us being able to work with our neighbors for us to see a way forward as a continent. But the AU does not play a sufficient role in guiding other countries that are within the umbrella of Africa, you know. So if it had been able to play a better role, we wouldn't be finding ourselves in a situation where ECOWAS can be able to say, we are going to take control of situations where we are going to fight for external powers. You know, ECOWAS has always done this. They uh, did something similar with Mali where they had that blockade, where they said that Mali cannot, uh, 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 they cannot fight for their own liberation and etc. But this is what I find very problematic because these are the same countries that have been uh, faced with a lot of challenges. The people, the population on the ground have been struggling, but ECOWAS never did anything. So now it makes you question the idea of diplomacy from your own region in itself that if you're saying that you see the people on the ground are struggling, the people in the ground are not successful, uh, life is not as successful as it would ideally, uh, if you would like it to be ideally for specifically your neighbor, you do nothing. When those people take a stand and say that we are tired of this corrupt um, neo-colonial neo -col uh, uh, society, we want to make a, a, a difference in our own realities on the ground, all of a sudden you now have this ability to say, you you know what we can we are going to fight go to war with these people you you see that means that it does not stand necessarily for the people themselves and if that is the case then it becomes very difficult for us to make an argument for diplomacy if we cannot interwork with ourselves and we cannot center the population of the continent all that I'm seeing is that these people see themselves in the future where they will have their own rebellions within the country, which will result in them being removed from power. So what they try to do is try to deter everyone else by going against these countries that have decided that they're going to take a different stance and they're going to fight against a system that is not for them. You know, so... <clears throat> With that being said, it means that ideas of something such as diplomacy being implemented on the ground and successfully so implemented on the ground 
become uh, uh, become very useless because at the end of the day, what we are seeing, especially with our leadership, is that it's every man for himself. What does not benefit them does not necessarily need to be focused on. They'd rather focus and center the most important thing, which would be their own uh, preservation. And how do you do that? You do that by making sure that you do not have the next rebellion in your footsteps. You know, so if that is the case, then it makes it very difficult for us to step down as people of the continent and make an argument for diplomacy. It 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 it, it is very frustrating, but it realistically, this is where we are, and this is where we are finding ourselves. It is, it's 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 not an easy way to move forward. But what we should also be able to do is we should be able to have constructive engagement and communication, which are not personal, which are not emotional about some of these laws that we put out ourselves as a people or as leadership of the continent, because there is no way that we can say that we agree that a president or a, a, a government is able to say that someone might face a uh, life in prison, someone might face death for their choice of who they've decided to love. I know that this is a very difficult engagement because some people will tell you that an African uh, to be a homosexual and whatnot, but on what basis are you able to say that the way that you want uh, to live your life, others must live it in that specific way? Why are you the moral high ground of uh, 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 moral high ground and point of departure of people's sexuality and their choices? It it's very problematic, you know. We can engage it on multiple levels, but also we need to hold our own leadership to account. Because now the first thing that needs to happen is that uh, other countries that are around Uganda they should be engaging with the leadership. It, 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 it is a very difficult one, but I hope that I did to an extent touch on what you were asking, Clarice. Thank you. Yeah, Paseka, thank you. And uh, in the same perspective, Mr. Ikane, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll still bring this con uh, questioner, uh, which has uh, something to do with actually international relations. And uh, I will be happy if you as an expert will bring more clarification on this. You, do, you know, we are looking at how the world is functioning now. I still want to capitalize on the words which you earlier said. If you don't have the power, then you, your voice is not heard be it economic power, be it uh, political, uh, and uh, uh, you can name the rest. My question is, given the way the things are unfolding in the world, and of course the quest by these superpowers to maintain uh, their position in the world to be in control. And now, do you think uh, they can go an extra mile to instigate violence or some unfavorable conditions in countries that are actually uh, wanting uh, to, to have that independence. We want to take Africa as a case study because uh, it's primarily concerns us, you know. So now, do you think in wanting to maintain these prowess in every aspect, these countries can uh, uh, try to uh, bring about a fragmentation of states? And if yes, now we are conversant. How can our stakeholders, be it political stakeholders and other stakeholders across the continent, how can we address this as a continent? You know, you said it. The essence of the talk is to see changes coming so that the future generation should not be entrapped in what we are facing today. So with all of these, uh, uh, the, the, the hidden uh, aspects of diplomacy and how things are ongoing in the world, the quest to be in control, how can we as a continent address this? Well, thank you once more. Um, um, the, fragment the fragmentation of the African continent and African countries has been in the core, in the core of the of um, of the Western uh, uh, politics in the, to control Africa. Okay. Um, the wars we experience in Africa today, the 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 
the interstate wars and intrastate wars, the, the tribalism we experience in Africa today, um, the, 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 the worn out practices we experience today, the, the religious uh, conflicts we experience today are, are things that are, have been carefully, those are, those are colonial inheritances. Those are colonial inheritances. And um, it's sad enough that we sometimes, sometimes have not taken stock of our history because um, we are victims of these things today because uh, I think the African people um, have not been very well steeped in their historical conscience. Yeah. You know, they are not well steeped in their historical conscience. And that's why I said there's been there's been generations of Africans. There's been the generations of the Nkrumahs and the Mandelas and, 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 and the Nyereres yeah. who, who beyond the, 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 the kind of leadership, the kind of leadership they, they, they engaged in was a, leader, was, was a conscientious leadership. Sure. That for Africa to move forward, they had to take stock of their history. They had to talk about slavery. They had to talk about colonization. Then came the, the then came the new governing Africa the, the new African governing class the one after independence put in place put in place by uh, these Western states and for most of these countries the, the is still the regimes of of the of the pre and post independence uh, Africa that are still in power today for some it's been a transition from father to son. Those are the realities of our continent today. And uh, we are victims. We are victims of a past that sometimes we did not create. And it is sad enough that we are, we've refused consciously or unconsciously to learn, uh, to learn about our history. And the people without a, his a historical conscience are people who cannot engage the, their future who cannot unlock their promises. Now, how do we, how do we engage the world, which today has all the mechanics, all the methods to coerce a poor and ridden, a, 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 a continent ridden of poverty, of poverty and all the, the other aspects you could think of. It would be, it, it's two things. The first are the people. The first are the people. We need to make and do a, in, uh, go through an, a total and a complete mental overhauling. We need to. And when we've succeeded to go through a complete mental overhauling, when we've, come, when we've been able to take stock of our past, when we've been able to embrace um, uh, 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 the 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 bitter the the bitter and the bitter pictures mm -hmm. of our common uh, story, then we can start appending solutions to the people we want to become. Then we can start uh, building institutions that reflect our past and our our present and the and, and the future we want to engage. Sure. When you take a stage as the African Union, the African Union is is the stage par excellence of African diplomacy. It is the, is it, it is the, the, uh, the foreground of African diplomacy. If in such, if such an institution, if such an institution can, can uh, has, does not have a story of an African funding, then there is a problem. It is no secret to anyone that the, the building in, in Addis Ababa was highly a gift from China. It is no secret to anyone that the funding, the funding of the African Union is primarily from the EU. Mm -hmm. When you don't have that kind of independence, how do you, how are you, how, how do you think you're able to project your voice on the global stage? The it is no forward? secret, it is no secret yeah. for any, to anyone that the discussions of, in the EU the discussions in the EU are sometimes done in the presence of Western leaders. I mean, the discussion in the EU. 
it is it is it is highly disturbing so you cannot we cannot we cannot start talking of becoming a counter force to these western powers which have the money which have the power they have the economic power they have the military power it is not possible do so you think is... we can start being the counter force in uh, by redefining our ideologies or bringing into play the ideologies of, of the uh, forefathers of uh, pan-africanism which you mentioned earlier on mm -hmm. like you, you be intentional about taking a milestone towards attaining an objective yeah i think it's possible i think it's possible because we have all that it takes sure. to turn the wheel around we have the resources we have the buoyant youth we have the populate we have the demography we have it we have all of it now um we we we've we've been so focused on the african elite and the african polit politician we cannot the, the the problem of africa is us is a civil society is the educational is the is the is the is the educational curriculum that we serve our children is the is the refusal of accountability is the silencing of dissent it's all of us involved so each time the problem of the african it's not just the African politician. It's all of us. Sure. And when, 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 a, when a crisis is happening in Mali, and you think it's Mali's problem, when a coup d'etat is happening in Burkina Faso, and you think it's, a, it's the people of Burkina Faso that have to deal with your issue, then there is a problem. When, you well, when we well know that the Western, um, the Western world considers Africa as one grouping. So it is, we have all it takes we have all it takes to turn the wheel around and, and why is it possible it's possible because uh, uh 20 years ago we give uh grants and funds to dubai we offered aids to uh, north korea to south korea to china 30 years ago not just the, in the recent past yeah. governments governments of africa offered loans to this country it, 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 we, we today they are multi-billionaires and they are engaging the world with a certain arrogance so why is it not possible for africa because they develop a certain a certain mentality you see china today the confucius they're using their language today to export they're exporting china you see uh qatar uses the world cup to export uh qatar and why would I tell you this? Why, why is it possible? 2010, 2010, one of the best World Cups ever organized in the world was the World Cup in South Africa. It was the World They don't say it enough, but it was one of the best World Cups. But before the World Cup, doom was promised. Everyone said, oh, we're going to die of malaria. We're going to die of mosquitoes in, in South Africa. But then it was a magnificent World Cup, which means when Africa, if each time Africa wants to join the global banquet intentionally. We do it with style because we have the people. We're just, we are happy people. Absolutely. We are uh, a welcoming people. We have all it takes. So it is possible, but it's, it only, it's only gonna be possible if we start reforming our mentalities. We start changing, we start accepting accountabilities. We start accepting the way business is done. We start saying, we start telling our leaders that you could decriminalize, you could uh, criminalize homosexuality without necessarily killing your people or, or submitting them to death sentence. So it is possible. Indeed, it is possible and it has started happening, of course, uh, Mr. Ekane. In the same light, uh, Mr. Paseka Farumeli, uh, while Mr. Ekane was talking, I, I was actually uh, uh, trying to think, you know, if Africa can give out loans, can help all the countries that are today uh, superpowers or uh, as far as uh, economic uh, buoyancy is concerned. And uh, the fact that Africa has the human capital, the resources. We want to understand because yeah, the essence of talking here is to bring solutions uh, uh, on how we can gradually start. It's, it's usually a subtle uh, process. It cannot just happen now, but subtly Africa can get to the top and Africa will get there. Conversant of all these 
endowment across Africa. We want to look and analyze this question. Uh, maybe the place of the World Bank and other uh, financial institutions like the International Monetary Funds and how they actually affect internal affairs in Africa. And then we also want to look at to what extent geopolitical maneuver in Africa has helped to kill this uh, conscious, like uh, the consciousness of an African person being intentional about uh, uh, maybe developing the African continent. Because if I can uh, understand clearly from the analysis that you gentlemen already presented, there is a problem. And the problem was the African mindset was actually attacked. Now, can we say the geopolitical game, which is uh, gaining grounds in the 21st century, is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, things are not going well in Africa? And if yes, how can we stand as one force towards at, uh, analyzing the problems of the continent and bringing African solutions to African problems? Please, uh, Mr. Paseka, can you unmute your mic? I apologize for that, Clary. It's okay. really sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, this is a very important question that you're asking because it is solution orientated and it can answer quite a few things so we can theorize a few things on how do we move forward as a continent. Uh, I was thinking while you were asking the question about the specific, uh, the specific uh, example of what China tried to do, where they started to become a source of uh, funding through their roots initiative, where they had said that um, they are going to be able to provide money to countries that need to be helped so that they can develop their countries with less restrictions and with less mendling in politics of that country. And I also thought about what the um, BRICS bank was meant to be, where it was also said that it would have less uh, policies in place uh, and less rules in place as compared to the IMF and the World Bank when it is going to be assisting uh, previously disadvantaged. And when I say previously, I mean in quotations, previously disadvantaged countries. Uh, because what those two initiatives were meant to do was to help us move away from centering Western, uh, Western basically uh, funding systems, which were always going to fund us, but they would benefit from funding us as a continent. I think the main thing that we should be thinking about is going along the lines of breaks. But what we would need to do, which I believe that uh, Brother Ekana did touch on when he spoke about Gaddafi, what we would need to do is to try and centralize our uh, economic systems in the continent. But what that means is that we would be going deliberately against Western imperial powers. And that is going to be very difficult because we have not had leaders with a backbone who are willing to stand for each other in a very long time. But if if, if we approach this from a solution orientated point of view, we need to streamline, uh, stream, uh, streamline our economic systems whereby there will be interdependence within the continent. We center a similar country which is backed by similar uh, minerals specifically because we are a mineral rich continent. If we were to do that, I can promise you Clarice, we would find ourselves in a position where we would have a backbone, a fi financial economic a backbone where we can be able to negotiate with the rest of the world and we can be able to center specific rules. But that will not happen with the current leadership that we have. And that is why it becomes such a shocker to the system when we find what is happening in Mali, Burkina Faso and uh, the Niger, etc., where these, uh, these people are actually speaking against the system and they are actually offering solutions for us because we've been taught to think in this specific way. Oh. We are in a state of shock, and that is why we find a country such as Nigeria and the rest of ECOWAS going against these countries, these particular countries, because they are shocked. It's a state of shock because it does not make sense how you can center yourself in a 
pro-imperialistic world, which has been a uh, pro them for the longest of time and has never centered us as Africans. And then all of a sudden, these new leaders who are coming up, uh, who are militarily based, who say, no, we are going to now center ourselves and our ideals. It, it becomes a shocker to the system. It, 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 our brains cannot comprehend this kind of leadership. And that is why it becomes so difficult for us to be able to agree on an economic streamlined approach uh, where we would center ourselves financially and be able to liberate ourselves from being interdependent uh, from, uh, with the rest of the West. Which, and we know that the rest, we see with the ICC, the, just recently America said that they were going to arrest the uh, investors for the ICC if they were to come in and arrest people. But the same ICC still has the, uh, uh, the, 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 the backing of the rest of the world when they say that they're going to arrest Putin. You see those contradictions and those ironies. What it means is that who controls, who con the, the, the people who control um, the world system, what we agree with, are the Western countries. All these bodies that are meant to be independent, the IMF, the World Bank, the ICC, and etc. All these bodies are actually dependent on specific countries throughout the world. So that means that these are not people we can be reliant on because these are countries that are controlled by those colonial powers that we have been emphasizing and we have been trying to move away from. So that means that there's no way that you can say that you are going to, to, to be able to move away from financial dependence in those uh, 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 former colonizers, former colonizers, but then you still go and you work with the IMF and the, and the World Bank. It, it's, it, it's just not possible and it will not be successful. So this is why we need to have leadership which is willing to cooperate and have interdependence within the continent before we can say that we'll successfully go out and navigate the rest of the world because the rest of the world is run by specific people specific countries until this day and that is why they can say that they can push their own agendas to the rest of the of the world and specifically the general south which is uh, significantly poorer in terms of uh, financially poorer as compared to them not mineral poor but uh, human induced poorer if i make sense yeah. i thank you clary I will stay with you, Mr. Paseka, of course. We, ha we have just five minutes to be together, so uh, this should be the last uh, question for the day. Uh, listening to, to what you have said, uh, something came to mind, uh, and I was trying to make us, uh, or I would love us uh, through your insight uh, to understand uh, the, the rhetorics uh, uh, that actually, you know, come with uh, the, the, the financial institutions, you know, the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, because we're seeing uh, how this is going to affect the, the economy of Uganda. So let's try to understand the, the, the rhetorics that comes or the, 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 that are hidden behind the engagement with these financial institutions and how it actually derails Africa's agenda for growth and development. Well, thank you very much, Clarice, for that, because it's, 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 it's a very important question that you're asking, which goes back to what we said when we started the engagement at, uh, at an earlier stage, where we said that the problem with Africa's development is over-reliant on external factors, because if the uh, the World Bank decides to cut funding to uh, Uganda, that is going to derail their own development. So that means that Uganda's development is dependent on external powers and external resources. Mm -hmm. And that means that if you go against those external powers and external resources, what is going to happen is that your development is going to be stagnant. You cannot move away from the position that you currently find yourself in or you'd like to move away from. And, and that, that, that makes it very difficult, Clarice, because what that speaks to, it speaks to these ideas that we're speaking to, uh, we're speaking about of what is sovereignty. Sovereignty is the idea that you do not have to account to external powers for you to make specific moves that concern policy, that concern law, and etc. But now, if you cannot implement things because your economy is going to be stagnant, that means that you are, go you are not sovereign, you are not independent of anyone. And it makes it very difficult for you to actually see a way forward as a said to be developing country. It becomes uh, borderline impossible. So how do you, uh, what, what, what is the solution to this? 
I always emphasize this, and this is not being a idealistic, but the, I, the, 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 the solution is for us to have leadership which centers African people so that we can speak now a move towards directions of a united central currency that the continent of Africa can be reliant on, and then we can move forward. Only that. But as soon as we still continue to look for assistance outside, it doesn't matter whether it's the East or the West. If we still are over-reliant on China, on Russia, on America, and the rest of the world. If we are still like that, that means that we'll not know sovereignty and independence. We will always be reliant on others, and we cannot move forward. Move, we cannot move forward or grow as a people of the continent. I thank you, Clarice. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Paseka Farumeli. Uh, coming to you for your concluding statement, Mr. Ekane Priestley. Uh, we were talking the uh, anti-gay law in Uganda. We are looking at the reaction from the World Bank uh, taking a very uh, stern decision of halting uh, new funding for Uganda and we are conversant of the implications. So the question is how can uh, the uh, World Bank, because for now Uganda is relying on the World Bank for funding and other partners are known, so how can the, com the, the government or the leadership of Uganda and the, the World Bank uh, uh, engage or what ways can they use to engage constructively in trying to see how they can actually uh, bring a, a solution to, to the problem at hand and see how they can st maybe uh, discuss on ways which will not uh, derail maybe even private sector investment in the country. Oh, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think um, um, with the current situation, um, diplomacy, uh, the, the idea of diplomacy comes to the fore because uh, this is huge. This is huge uh, financial cuts from Uganda. And I think instead of uh, seeking for a counter force, uh, 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 financial counter force, maybe relying on other new uh, bilateral or multi multilateral partners, I think um, it would be in Uganda's interest uh, to engage in some sort of um, negotiation with this uh, financial uh, institution, which is the uh, World Bank, um, not necessarily to coerce, not necessarily to um, uh, negotiate on their terms, but like I said, um, it is also important for a body like the African Union to engage in talks with uh, uh, the government of Uganda um, to review, uh, to review certain internal laws, not necessarily infringing on their sovereignty, but to review certain internal laws, which uh, uh, should have a respect for human dignity. And like Mr. Paseka said, and I found that really interesting, um, the only way we can build a better Africa, which engages the world in, a, in, 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 in multi-dimensional ways, is to adopt an Afrocentric mentality, which is not idealist, but an Afrocentric mentality in politics, in government, in economics, in, uh, in, 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 in culture, that would be able to um, that would be able to engage the African people together in a union, and it's the only way to be able to um, um, uh, join the, the 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 global banquet on uh, on terms of of legitimacy. And the people of Africa need to understand that Afrocentricity uh, is not a counterforce to Afro pessimism. Or it's, not a, or it's not necessarily uh, a, 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 a counterforce to Western um, um, uh, Western uh, um, ideologies or Western um, uh, uh, I don't know colonialism. Yeah. It's a way proper to us. It's us re reviewing who we are as a people. It's us reviewing our slave story, our colonial story, our historiography. Uh, ourselves, ourselves as a people, in order to be able to engage the world. So um, I think it is important because as much as we we are we are we are hampering 
on on like as the content the problem is not the law the problem is the content of the law because today uh, we would find african countries uh, emerging with certain laws and then we, we we take it under the guise of a color of a, of a western attack no it's just like you would you would uh, you would see a country sanctioning people who are against uh, female genital mutilation that is that is barbaric female genital mutilation is barbaric it's not because and some people would tell you it's an african way no it's barbaric in every sense of, of, of every sense of, of the term just like killing a homosexual is barbaric in the 21st century so it's i think it's, it's more about interpret interpreting the laws and finding uh finding a certain ground that is beneficial to the people of uganda and uh, who beyond existing in africa exist in the world Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ikane, for uh, the uh, uh, great insight. I want to ap uh, appreciate uh, uh, you to Mr. Pasaka Faromeli and Ikane uh, Presley uh, for the uh, uh, thoughtful insight uh, regarding a topic for discussion this day on the Pan African. Well, and I was very, I was very happy to have Mr. Pasaka. <laughs> me too. Me too. In, indeed, indeed. <laughs> we are looking forward to having such engaging and uh, comprehensive uh, uh, debate programs that will go a long way uh, to change narratives across Africa. Remember, it's the moment of a narrative shift in every dimension. Thank you so much. And it is on this note, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to draw the curtains into today's edition of the program. But don't go away. Keep having a lovely moment in the company of programs on Africa Media TV. Bye-bye and see you soon next. Thank you.